Disney Plus, the home of some weird and just downright controversial content. A lot of good stuff too, but today we're going to be focusing on the weird and controversial. Because you've really got to wonder when films in which a 32 year old woman romantically kisses a 12 year old boy make the cut. What does a film have to do to not make it onto Disney Plus? And while yes there are some obvious examples like, I don't know, Song of the South, which Disney want to keep that as far away from everyone as possible forever. And in fact, there are actually 650 Disney owned films not on Disney Plus according to what's on Disney Plus.com. More like what's not on Disney Plus.com. I'm sorry. Anyway, as a lot of you know, I am the world's leading expert on the Disney sequels and have been trying to track down a VHS tape for Beauty and the Beast Bell's Tales of Friendship for a few months now. And by that I mean I found it on eBay in April and have just procrastinated making this video for three months, but today I finally did it. I got the Beauty and the Beast sequel that is so bad they didn't even put it on Disney Plus. And then I also ordered this Hercules sequel which also isn't on Disney Plus and I've got them both here. The final two renaissance sequels that I haven't reviewed in my hands right now. And it only cost over 20 pounds per film. Like the VHS tapes on their own were like a fiver each, but the shipping, they might as well have gone on a tour of America for the price I paid for them. And actually going through their tracking history, that seems to be exactly what they did. A tour of American post offices, apparently. And then after all that, it came out in black and white. I guess there must be some sort of problem in terms of translating these cables from a US VHS to a UK VCR or something, because I tried my Toy Story tape and it worked perfectly fine. Like, look at that beautiful color. And maybe you think I'm making too big a deal out of this, but you need to understand, I spent 40 pounds on these VHS tapes just for this one reason. That was almost as much as I spent on an entire year of Disney Plus. And it clearly works in color. I'm fine. It's not the end of the world. I'm just gonna sit down, take a breather, make a phone call. We'll be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Deep breaths. Wait, what? Yeah, that would cheer me up massively. That would make my day. You're joking, right? Oh, I, I gotta tell everyone. Guys, this video is sponsored by Surfshark. Now, if you don't already know, Surfshark is a fast and secure VPN. And when I say fast and secure, I mean fast and secure. Let me just, let me show you. One click and I'm connected to the internet. Two clicks and I'm surfing the internet from a different country now. And in terms of security, it's literally a privacy protection tool. That's what a VPN is. Now, the thing I personally love about Surfshark is that it's totally unlimited. A lot of you know I went to America earlier this year and I couldn't have survived without it. I was signing on my computer, my laptop, my UK phone, my American phone. I got two phones when I was in America because I needed an American number. It was a whole thing. But it's not like it's something that's just Apple exclusive. If you've got an Android, Windows device, or you name it, it works. And I was able to access BBC iPlayer as if I was sitting in my living room. And now I'm able to access things like Hulu literally sitting in my living room. Also, if you're from the UK and thinking of trying it out, I've got some tips. You know, Pixar's new amazing film Onward, it's available on Disney Plus if you change your location to America. Or maybe you want to try out the Australian Netflix, which has access to the Fantastic Beast films. And with my code Gorman, G-O-R-M-A-N, that's my surname, you can get 85% off plus an extra three months for free. I, I can't get my head around how good a deal that is. 85%? And also, Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee. So there's literally no risk. Link in the description down below. Checking it out would help the channel a lot. And with that said, let's get into it. First up, I'm gonna do Hercules. You've waited three months for Bell's Tales of Friendship. You can wait five minutes more. Hercules, zero to hero. This is actually a song in the original Hercules, so this satirical singing isn't really that effective with this one, but I'm about this close to bringing back Seamus complains about the title because this title makes no sense. This film takes place in that period where Hercules is getting strong, you know, during that One Last Hope song. A mid-call, as my comments will so gladly tell you, is if me calling a film a 24-minute call was 100% serious, showing my clear ignorance to the existence of the word mid-call. But my problem is, given when the film takes place, he's still zero. Like, he doesn't become a hero until he defeats the Hydra and saves Feed. So like, if you called it Hercules One Last Hope, I would have said that was clever because it takes place in the song. That would have been the best title ever out of these films. Hercules 2, it's a classic and it works. Even High School Musical Hercules Edition would have made for a better title. It's actually, that would have been the perfect title for this film, but 
We'll get back to that. First, we need the context. This isn't really a film. I mean, it is kind of. It's a package film combining three episodes of Hercules the Animated Series as flashback segments, a show that I didn't even know existed. But had I googled the film before rashly throwing my money at it, I could have seen this on its Wikipedia page. I literally copied and pasted that line that I said 10 seconds ago. It's a package film combining three episodes of Hercules the Animated Series as flashback segments. And there are actually 65 episodes of this series. Somewhere. Not that I have any intention of watching. I saw three episodes and that was plenty enough. So the premise is that apparently Zeus insisted Hercules went to school in that period while he was training to be a hero. Which is a bit confusing because you'd think by the time this film begins he's already a teenager, right? So just starting school? And like, did the ancient Greeks even go to school? Oh, apparently they did from the ages of seven to 14. Are you telling me Hercules is seven? You know, I get it. It's just a fictional story and supposed to be a bit of fun. And remember that joke I made earlier where I said it could have been called High School Musical Hercules Edition? Well, I'm getting back to it now. So just imagine every single film you've ever seen revolving around an American high school. I know there are probably a lot of them, but just imagine them and take every cliche from them and Greekify it. And actually, I think that might be the best way to attack it. Welcome to Hercules High School Cliché Edition. New kid joins the school and makes a fool out of himself on the first day. He's forced to become friends with the resident loser kid who's in love with a really pretty girl who doesn't like him at all. And then the new kid, not understanding the school's hierarchy or something, decides to stand up to the bully. It's just like nothing I've ever seen before. But what really confuses me is Hercules gets beaten by this kid. Which like, wasn't the whole point of Hercules that he was so insanely strong he became an outcast and had to go seek out a new life because this bully is immortal. Like, they say it later on in the film. He's mortal. Obnoxious, but mortal. And I get Hercules maybe taking the moral high ground and not fighting back intentionally, but couldn't you still avoid the humiliation, at least? Anyway, back to the cliches, because the new kid decides to earn the respect of his classmates by defeating a monster. Okay, yeah, the whole monster bit may be a bit different, but I said Greekifying it. And then he defeats the monster, but the bully takes the credit for it, so the moral is, who cares what other people think as long as I know? Or something like that. That counts as a cliche. It's just like, I've complained about the other Disney sequels for ripping off romantic films before, but this one... Is ripping off a stereotypical Disney Channel movie, like of all the things you could rip off. Anyway, then a new kid arrives at the school who's even cooler than the resident bully and every girl falls in love with him, including the main girl that the resident loser kid likes. And I don't know, another really weird thing about this film is that it randomly references other films. Like, I don't even know where this whole running towards each other in slow motion trope even came from, it's so old. Like, I've only actually ever seen it being used, ironically, in films. But in this film, they don't just do it once, they do it three times. Within the space of 15 minutes! Then the resident bully and the resident loser bond over how much they hate this new guy, which would have been a great cliche storyline, but they don't really follow through with it. Like, it's more of a side story in this 20 minute story, which definitely doesn't need a side story. The rest of the movie then turns into a superhero film for some reason. Like, remember the new guy that every girl was in love with? He's actually a superhero called the Grim Avenger, and he teams up with Hercules to take on a Minotaur, so you could say, the Avengers assemble. I'm sorry. Honestly, they don't even end up doing much good. Hercules ends up destroying more stuff than the Minotaur he was fighting destroyed in the first place. And then the Minotaur becomes self-aware too. I don't know, it's confusing. We need more cliches! Science fair. The bully makes a model volcano, which turns out to be an actual working volcano and goes on to destroy Hercules' project, leading to Hercules getting a bad grade, which... I know that's so specific, but it also feels like the most generic high school film cliche of all time. Hercules complains about the bully to his dad and plays the classic You wouldn't last 24 hours as a human teenager. So naturally, Zeus turns himself into a human to see what human school's like. Freaky Friday, by the way, if you're wondering. Except Hercules technically doesn't know his dad's at the school, but do you know who does? Hades. He makes a comeback, realizing Zeus is mortal and sees this as his chance to kill him. But just as he's about to do so, Hercules saves Zeus and when Hades addresses him, he's clearly aware he's Zeus's son. Which I don't know about you, but I recall him finding out that Hercules was still alive didn't happen to a later date and was actually a pretty big deal, but you know what? It doesn't matter. This is just for fun. And they end up playing fetch with Cerebus, the Hellhound, so... Real fun. I was gonna call him out for ripping off Percy Jackson with that, but then I realized this came out in 1998, so... Rick? Were you watching the Hercules TV series? You were, weren't you? I, I see you! Then Zeus becomes a god again in the end. High School Musical Hercules Edition. 
Actually, before I go, there's a scene in one of the earlier shorts where two monsters get told off by their mother for eating a delivery boy because he's apparently junk food. So she forces them onto a strict diet where they can only eat the upper class. And I wrote in my notes, well, doesn't that just bring a new meaning to eat the rich? That was the best joke I came up with for the film. And I just forgot to mention it in any, I didn't find a space for it. So yeah, I'm gonna be honest. Yeah, this film isn't good. It's hardly even a film, but high school movies are kind of my guilty pleasure. So for that reason, I'm gonna give it a 3.8, meaning it's kind of just in the middle somewhere. Not really then, but it's just, it's there. And with that said, it's time to, <clears throat> one last time, the final Disney Renaissance sequel. Bell's Tales of Friendship. So I feel like the title might be the only thing I can praise this film for, so. Well done, Disney. It is an absolutely incredible title. It is just amazing. I am so proud of you. Okay, with that out of the way, I don't think there's anything I can say that will prepare you for this. But oh my god, it's a live action Belle! Which does like Emma Watson who? Am I right? I prefer the real Belle. There goes the I said the real Belle. That's right. Perfection. Yeah, so this film did something different, for sure. With the other sequels, I've relatively reluctantly complained about the animation from time to time. The worst I ever said was that occasionally I felt it was a little bit lazy, which in all honesty, calling animation lazy might as well be an oxymoron, but I guess me growing up with the animation era I grew up with, I'm a bit of an animation snob. But I want to take it all back. The animation in these films is so good. You can tell how hard the animators work, even if the story wasn't that great. And I just, you guys did a great job. This film, on the other hand, it looked awful. It actually was lazy. The story consists of Belle, who has a bookstore now. I don't know where the beast is. They don't actually mention that, but she does have these two sentient worms who live in the store, which I don't think I'm exaggerating here. When I say that might be the worst visual effects I've ever seen in a movie. Like there isn't a single shot where they look good. Up close, far away, in the background, they look awful. Even in these scenes where Belle is talking to them, meaning they are not moving and it would have been so much easier just to put puppets in their place. They've still been added in in post. Like it just looks so bad. And like, it's not even as if it's that old. This film came out in 1999. Visual effects weren't that far back in 1999. You have Toy Story 2, The Phantom Menace, The Matrix all coming out that year. There is no reason for a Disney produced film to look like this. There's also a cat and sentient book in this store. They're not as bad, but still not great. And I don't know if it's the same sentient book as the one from Belle's Magical World, but like I thought the curse was lifted. So there's still a living being stuck in this book, but no one seems to care. I guess we just have to look past that. And then finally, just in terms of characters, I'm already exhausted. There are all these children just casually walking around the store without any parental supervision because I guess that's how it works in this universe, that's fine. But because they're there, Belle gets them to help tidy the store with her. For fun. And the acting. Oh my god. It's... Imagine a school play. Yeah, that, that's what it's like. Child acting is never really good. Like, I feel like that's a rule of cinema. You can only expect so much from a literal child. But the thing with this is it feels like they just took the first take every time. Like, yeah, that was good enough. And it just upsets me because the whole story consists of Belle telling these kids tales of friendships. So every five minutes it transitions to a lovely animated short, whether it be about this dwarf moose who can't fit in because he's so small and he's sad. Until one day when he meets this regular sized moose whose antlers are really small and they realize if they work together, they can be as good as everybody. That, that's the moral of the story, I guess. Hansel and Gretel. You know the story of Hansel and Gretel, right? Well, in this one, these elves come and save Hansel and Gretel from the witch because they were friends or something like that. And that's the moral. This story about a hen who needs help planting corn, but her friends, the pig and the duck, refuse to help. However, when the corn is ready to eat, they can't have any because they didn't help. I don't actually know what this one says about friendship. Help your friends and reap the rewards. Or even the three little pigs. One house of straw, one house of sticks, one house of bricks. 10 out of 10 huff and puffing, and then they seek refuge with the other pig who built his house of bricks. So I guess the moral is, if you do something well, you can 
help your friends later? I don't know. However, despite the messaging upon reflection being kind of questionable, I do think these shorts are actually really good. The animation, as I said, is lovely, and I really vibed with the musical numbers in them. I don't know why, I just really did. <laughs> Okay, that's enough of that. We don't want to get copyright claimed. And it's sad because I can picture these studio executives who are like, oh, well, you've made some great shorts here, but even if we put them all together, it only makes up 20 minutes. We need to pad the runtime to make this a feature film. So yeah, we're going to fill it with a horribly acted live action Beauty and the Beast film. Are you okay with that? Actually, never mind, you don't get a say. Then finally, kind of randomly, there's just a random Beauty and the Beast short thrown in the mix, bang in the middle. And honestly, it feels like this was made for the original Beauty and the Beast mid call Belle's Magical World, but they were so desperate to pad the runtime, they kind of went over and were like, can we steal one of your shorts for our film? And yeah, they didn't get a say either. So I guess it's time for short four. If you work together, everything will go well. Or something like that. So Mrs. Potts gets sad because the weather is bad and everyone else decides to throw her a party to cheer her up. We meet the full cast from Belle's Magical World, including the dictionary pen and parchment, further proving my theory that this was stolen. So everyone splits into groups to work on things for the party. We meet the kitchen, which is just alive in pretty much every way imaginable, making me wonder even more how many servants did this guy have? Like, there are literally two sentient oven mitts who are just there to disagree about everything. Why? 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 This film's really starting to get to me. Lumiere and Cogsworth both want to lead the music and are also arguing throughout the short, but I'm just sat here like, this was your chance to bring back the Nightmare Organ. How do you keep persistently disappointing me? These videos might genuinely be becoming too much for me. And because everyone's arguing, everything goes wrong. The music gets set on fire, the cake explodes, Chip accidentally spills the beans that they're throwing a party and the party gets cancelled. And honestly, good. It was a stupid party anyway. But then after all that, they decide to team up and throw the party. And I guess the parts of it all going well weren't important because they're not included in the film. They just skip right to it going well. And Mrs. Potts is happy again. The sun starts shining. Yay. Also, if you were wondering where was the beast this entire time, he was sleeping for the entire day. Just a really long nap. I don't know. If I've learned one thing from this series, it's that it's better not to question it. And with that said, we can place the final film onto this Disney Renaissance sequel tier list. While I don't think it had as much nightmare fuel as the organ from Belle's Enchanted Christmas, by God was it just as hard to look at and the story was 10 times worse. So for that reason, I'm giving it a 1.6 out of 10, by far the worst out of the sequels and bottom of the list. I can't believe we're done. Oh my. I mean, we're not completely done. We're gonna do Cinderella because everyone keeps commenting, you've got to do the Cinderella sequels. It's just not gonna go on this tier list because it's gonna be like separate, but yeah. I will guess I'll see you when I do Cinderella. I'll see you before I do Cinderella because I've got other videos that are gonna come out before then. But uh, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like. You can subscribe to my channel. You can watch another video. You can check out my Patreon and go to the links in the description down below if you want to check out Surfshark. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.